só para ter o controle do tempo. Sim. Ah, o que é o PDF? Ah, o, ah, o... Sim, sim. Vai ter um pouquinho. Vai ter um pouquinho. Mas é de ajuste. Se você colocar para mim o PDF aqui, tá ok. Não, não. Não, às vezes é só uma seta que foi no lugar errado. Não. Ok, good morning. Uh, my name is Eduardo, and this, my paper is Computational Design of a Theory Glass Pi Topology Circulator. And I produced this paper with my advisor, Sebastian Renu. Uh, okay, in this presentation, I, uh, we do some introductory concepts, and after I will show the schematic proposed. The simulation setup and the results. Okay, uh, a circulator is a device. Uh, in some cases, it has three ports, and he. The behavior is presented by this matrix S. Okay. So here we have a circulatory path of our signal, okay? And if we put our if we put our signal in port one, he goes to port two, and if we put in port two, he goes to port three, and if we put the signal in port three, it goes to port one, okay? Uh, the most the most device uh, is produced by using a ferrite, but uh, we have some limitations in this use because because he's a bulk a bulky device, and we cannot use in a cell phone, for example, uh, and because this today we have. Nowadays we have a transistor circulator too, but we have some problems with this topology because it's a little difficult to to use when we have a lot of power in our system, and we can explain the circulatory path using the Larmor precession. Uh, we, have, we have attempt to align the magnetic moment, mu, uh, with a magnetic field, B, okay? And if, it's, if you have a, a, a little angle between the field and the magnetic moment, this will produce uh, U turns 
with an angular velocity, and it is increased the degeneration of resonant states in sense of counterpropagation and induces the no reciprocity. But in the case of our circulator, we have uh, we need to emulate the physical phenomenon uh, into a, a circuit. And the final step is uh, that we have uh, three identical resonant loops, okay, Reson with the resonance uh, described by this equation. And omega i of t is equal to omega zero plus an amplitude omega m cosine uh, of omega mt plus an a phase. And omega m is a modulated uh, frequency, okay? And the phase between these three uh, resonant loops is 2 pi over 3 radians. We can, here we can see the epsilon and we can convert this electromagnetic uh, term in a variable capacitance. In electronic, we have a device uh, to do it uh, and it is a varactor. But the purpose of this presentation is not to explain the physical. And if you want to understand more about the physical behind this device, I strongly recommend you to read these two papers, okay? So, as I said before, we need to, uh, to do this uh, emulating. We need to choice of a reactor and the first attempt is select a compatible delta C. And here we have a resonant frequency. And if we choose an L and a operating frequency of our circulator, then we have to pur propose a value of the capacitor. Uh, our circulator has the operating range frequency in 902 megahertz to 928 megahertz. So for these operating frequencies, we selected these two models of varactors, okay, uh, manufactured by Skyworks. And here we put the SPICE model in ADS and we simulate it. And here is the curve of the first model. We selected 10 nano angers to the inductor. So for our fre operating frequency, the value of capacitor needs to cover this range, about 90.5 picofarads and four picofarads. Look into this graph, we, we, look, we need to put the voltage in 2.5 to 0 0.2 volts to feed this varactor. The another Varactor uh, has a different curve, and for the same inductor value, uh, we have the same capacitance range, but the voltage, the necessary voltage to fit this varactor is very different. Here is the full schematic of the topology proposed. Uh, we have 
three identical resonant loops. And look into only one loop. Here we have two ports. And, and the port one is to the modulation signal and RF signal. And here the other port is to the DC voltage. This, this source here, inputted here, is only to feed the varactor. And our RF signal is composed by a resonance, a series resonance, composed by L2 and our varactor. It needs to, to operate with this equation. And we know our resonance frequency is the same of our RF signal. And we fix, we select a fixed value for our inductor, and then we, we need to, to select a capacitor with cover this all range here. And our modulation signal path is composed by uh, C1 and L1 here. The same equation here, but we have this, this equation uh, for the modulation frequency. Uh, it's dependent of the Q factor. So what's the Q factor? The Q factor is composed by this LC tank here, okay? And with this LC tank, we, we couple our source to our circuit. And we do some simulations. And this, this LC tank is similar to ferromagnetic resonance in ferrite circulators. So in this case, it means we have to, to put the, the resonance frequency outside the, our operating band. In our case, we selected 200 megahertz to 14 megahertz, to 400 megahertz, sorry. And in this frequency, we have the maximum losses, so we need to put our operating frequency outside in the modulation frequency too, outside the resonance frequency of this LC tank. And here we have our result. The Q factor for our bandwidth is almost 10. Our simulation setup, the first attempt, uh, we used uh, the S parameter simulation because we need the only to see the, the S parameters of this device. But the S parameter uses only a term now. And it, it isn't work. And we change to LSSP, large signal S parameter simulation. And here we can use a port with a certain uh, power with a frequency and we can use the modulation source too. And finally, our results, we, we, do, we did four simulations. The first simulation, we, we put our central frequency, 915 megahertz, uh, matched on 50 ohms. And in this case, using the SMV, one, two, three, five. And these parameters here, we, we had this result. Uh, we, with this first result, we, we have, we can see that the device uh, operates like a circulator because S11 is equal to S22 and equals to S33 
It means insertion loss of all ports is equally. The second simulation, we change our modulation frequency and we obtain a more balanced solution. Third simulation, we change our character and with this, we could uh, decrease our sources values, but the result is the same of the others. And in the four simulation, uh, we have we had our best result. Insertion loss is about one dB, okay, and it, this value is similar to the favorite circulators that we have in the industry. Uh, so, if you have any questions, thank you. Um, what is the power level that can be um, handled by this kind of, uh, uh, of circulator? Do you have an idea? Yes. Uh, the limitation is of our components. For example, our, our varactor uh, permits only two watts. And it's in, in our case, that's okay because we want to use uh, on our FID and to what is that's okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. So if no more question, we want to thank you, the speaker. Uh, the next presentation will be by Thales from Sperling uh, on evaluation of an IoT device designed for transparent traffic analysis. Uh, Thales Luis from Sperling is an undergraduate in network engineering at the University of Brasilia. He will graduate in December this year. He studied abroad at the University of Arkansas through the Brazil Scientific Mobility Program as a Capes Scholar. Currently, he is a part of the Universal Internet of Things research projects at the University of Brasilia. Hello. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to do something different and present right over here next to my presentation so nobody gets, cr gets any crossed eyes. So my name is Thales. Thank you, everybody, for being here. And today I'm going to talk about an ongoing project on my laboratory here at University of Brasilia, which is the evaluation of an IoT device designed for transparency traffic analysis. Uh, do we have a anchor? First, going over the agenda of the presentation, I'm going to give a brief introduction why we're doing this. Then I'm going to talk about the system architecture explaining how we're doing this. Then I'm going to go over the evaluation part of the project. And then I'm going to uh, talk about the conclusion of future work and tell how we're moving forward with this project. Well, uh, the main motivation here is the, uh, the growth of the internet. Everybody knows that the internet has been growing for the last two decades. But now we have. Uh, many different devices coming into our normal communication networks. And these are the IoT devices. And sometimes the de these devices, they are small devices, and they are not capable of processing the security protocols that we use in our computers. So in many times, they transmit uh, sensitive data, maybe your heart rate or the temperature in the room, 
in an unencrypted way. So if this data is leaked by any reasons or anybody is capable of capturing, that could be an issue, a security issue for us. So our proposal here is to do a transparent monitoring. And we want to track these IoT devices within our network. So we do, to accomplish this, we need to first describe our architecture, and we need to talk about some of the functionalities with our we're going to embed in our device. The first one is that we want to perform a traffic into WPA personal networks, which is the normal networks that we use in our households or the network that we all are accessing right now. And we, we don't need access to management infrastructure, which means that I do not own the access point or the router that is configured for the, a given network. So since we're talking about Wi-Fi networks, of course we want a port portability. We want to take care, uh, pick up our device and take it with us wherever we go. And we want to uh, implement in a transparent way, which means that we don't want to uh, do any extra configuration in the end user or in the uh, management infrastructure of the network. And in, in order for our device to work, of course we need to sustain a network connectivity. Uh, here, uh, I point out that the, our device is going to implement a man the middle attack. So for Wi-Fi networks, that's, this technique is also known as evil twin access point. But we're proceeding this in an ethical hacking philosophy, which means that we're implementing these techniques in order to increase our security, not necessarily to hack anybody. And our device also is going to try to discover the Wi-Fi network credentials by implementing a brute force method, which is testing many different keys until you find the correct one. There are other ways to, to get a network credentials, but we do, at this point, we do not have it implemented in our device. So here we have so here we have the architecture workflow of, uh, of our solution. And first, you only have this scenario right here, where you have the original access point providing internet access to the workstations. And the workstations connect to this, this access point and can browse through the internet. So right here, we are adding this third entity into this environment, which is our, our proposed device. This device is going to interfere into the connection of these workstations in the access point. We do this so no extra configuration needs to be done into workstations. So right now, uh, a normal usage would be the workstations are connected to the access point, and then our device comes into the picture. It starts monitoring all the traffic here in the, between the workstations and the original access point. But at this point, we are not monitoring yet because all traffic between these two entities are, is, uh, is going over. There's an encryption between them, so we can't know what's going on. So we need to interfere. So we first disconnect. We force to disconnect these workstations to disconnect from this original access point by sending uh, Wi-Fi networks management frames, which are not cryptified, and then we force this, we clone the credentials of this access point, and we force these workstations to connect to us, and we continue to provide internet access to the original access point. So our device here is working as a bridge. All of this process that I just described is done automatically by our device, given it picks up a, a signal from an access point. Just to talk more, more about our first prototype, we built this in a Unix-like environment. We, don't, we tested in many different uh, operating systems. And it's important to mention the wireless interface that we're using. Because this, uh, this particular device here can provide, we can operate Wi-Fi in many different modes. So you can do manage mode, access point mode, and monitor mode, which is the mode we use to capture the data between the workstations and the access point. And our first prototype was implemented in the Raspberry Pi. So now that I talked about our solution, of course, we wanted to evaluate whether it's, we're 
going in the right direction or what, whether we need to change what we're doing. So the first test that we did was a stress test. We, we did this stress test to define the operational ratings of our device. So we built a, a scenario where uh, of a normal Wi-Fi network that we would, you would find in a house, a couple of devices connected to a single access point, and then we created data flows between only two workstations. The other workstations here, they are only added to simulate a normal environment, but they do not have any data flows go, uh, going between them. They only exchange uh, management frames with the access point. So we did this data flows between these two workstations and we analyzed network traffic and the processing that our, and the processing done by our device. The results, the results that we got w is that at maximum ratings, our device is capable of delivering a bandwidth of 30 megabits per second, but it delivers a, a package loss of our, almost 100%. So those are, that is not our internet, uh, the operational ratings that we want. So what we did is to, was to decrease and control the bandwidth that our device could achieve and until we got a, a packet loss rate uh, that it was satisfaction for us. And then we discovered that we thought that those results of the 30 megabit bits was due to the processing power of our device implemented in the Raspberry Pi, but we find out that it wasn't. We even implemented in other platforms to evaluate the hardware we were using. And in all of the hardware that we tested, we could find that the, CP, the processing percentage of the, uh, all platforms was very low. So that was the first problem with our first uh, prototype. Then we did a second scenario. Now more focus on only one workstation, which would be like a person using the internet in a normal way. So we had this workstation. Uh, first, it was streaming a video from, from the internet uh, or connected by this access point. And then in the second, second test, we had the, the workstation streaming the same video, but connected to our device. And we wanted to measure the quality of experience a user would have, whether he would notice that the internet, internet connection was affected by our device or not. And the results that we got, it was a pretty uh, sex, sex stuff over. They were, they, were pretty, they were pretty good. Although the connection speeds are different here, you can see at the drop frames, which is the most important metric for quality of experience, you don't have a lot of frames. We were watching a, a video that was going at 30 frames per second. So 200, 300 frames, it's almost nothing compared to the, the whole duration of the video. In conclusion, in the first prototype, we could achieve what we, we wanted to propose. And we had many issues regardless the hardware and the compatibility issues, but they were addressed. We, we did actually monitor, could monitor the Wi-Fi traffic in a transparent way. We did no extra configuration in the end user or the router. And of course, with our tests, we, we could notice that the wireless interface that we picked was the performance limited. So just to finalize, uh, the future work we spread out into different, two different branches. The first branch was to focus on a spe specialized hardware design, and the second line of work would be to transform the solution into a dis distributor system. Thank you, everybody, and any questions? Any questions? We have a mic here and five more minutes of time. How did the uh, internet side of your spoofing device look? Were you connected to the same uh, LAN or uh, because if you say you switch, you switch over to a different LAN, would it, uh, would it not uh, possibly affect the connections that uh, your client already used? So the external gateway, the, the route to internet is actually the same. We're not interfering into the access to the internet you're doing. 
So we only interfere between the connection of your device and the access point you have in the same room. So that's the connection that we're dealing with. Okay, but if you have actual network access uh, on the Ethernet between the access point and the Internet, uh, why do you go through all this hassle when you could just uh, capture the frames there? Well, uh, so our device, it's going to, after we can achieve the WPA credentials, our device is going to clone your, your Wi-Fi credentials, so we're going to start to propagate the same SSID with the same security. So what... For the workstation, that is going to uh, look like a, just an extended service set. So it, given your device is closer to our access point, it can do the roaming automatically. Okay. If no more questions, I would like to thank the speaker and thank the audience for attendance. I believe uh, we have a uh, break till, Bruno, correct me if I'm wrong, till 2 o'clock. Till 2 o'clock, there is a lunch break uh, uh, to follow right now. Thank you very much.